Oxalate ends up accumulating in your body and you can get reactions from oxalate even when you stop eating it. In fact, some of the reactions to oxalate get even more worse when you stop eating it because now you're allowing your body to remove oxalate that's been accumulating in your body. And the, the kind of effects it has on your cells leads to all kinds of symptoms and it's quite different for each person. Hey guys, welcome to this week's episode and today's guest is Sally Norton. She is a vitality coach, speaker and health consultant and she helps you understand the root of your aches, your pains and what might actually be causing the problem could be oxalate poisoning. She focuses you on helping you to figure out what low oxalate foods and to build extra energy and to have you have faster healing. So welcome, Sally, and tell us a little bit about your own personal health journey and how did you even become interested in this? Thank you, Chantel. It's fun to be with you and your audience. It's really good. Yeah, I was in a position of complete desperation and could not see this problem at all. And I probably had it forever. I was basically on the sofa, I couldn't work anymore, I couldn't hardly read the mail, I couldn't exercise. I felt like garbage. And it took me several years of researching and experimentation to finally crack the problem, which is I had this problem of a body that had gotten overloaded with oxalate because I was eating foods that were super high in oxalate. And I just never had learned that. I, you know, I went to Cornell for a nutrition degree. I've been in the health space my whole career. I've worked with all kinds of holistic healing practitioners in my career. And I just never even understood this at all. And so I really had to go back to the books. When I finally understood it in my own body who was telling me this, then I basically a full-time researcher because my whole mental map of how health works and what food is healthy and what isn't was being completely thrown overboard. So let's talk about name some foods that are high in oxalate. Potatoes, sweet potatoes, peanuts, almonds, cashews, and almost all the nuts. Most of the seeds that people like, like chia seeds, uh, blackberries, raspberries, kiwi, clementine, uh, let's see. Vegetables. What about spinach? What about yeah. spinach? That's like the poster child for oxalate. That's the one that your urologist recognizes as high in oxalate. He doesn't recognize potatoes are high, but he knows spinach are high. And so a urologist will tell you to not eat your greens, which is kind of silly because there's three or four major greens that are high in oxalate. And that would be spinach, Swiss chard, beet greens, and some kinds of kale. The kale's the so weird what about the beets themselves? Is it just the beet greens or is it the, you know, you, you have your beet and you've got your red beet and then you've got the beet greens that come out of it. Is it the beet itself or is it just the beet greens? It's both. The greens just happen to be even more concentrated. It's almost like, you know, rhubarb is a famously high oxalate food. If you eat the rhubarb leaf, which you never do, you could die from it. And children have been known to die from playing with and feeding each other rhubarb and rhubarb leaves. And the stalk is less oxalate, but the stalk is still crazy high, crazy high in oxalate. And, and mm. the food that um, in the US and most Western countries you don't eat too much that's incredibly high in oxalate like rhubarb is, is star fruit. Tennessee star fruit poisonings in Brazil and Eurasia and places where star fruit is accessible and considered a superfood. And that's the thing, people use things like star fruit or spinach or blackberries or turmeric is another really high oxalate food. And that's not a seed, that's a root. Uh, these are considered to be superfoods. I mean, pomegranate is also sold as a superfood and it's high in oxalate. And that's getting to be pretty scary because in the last 10 years, we've gotten so we're promoting spinach and almonds and using almonds as a substitute for what people used to eat in a way without paying attention to the fact that it's full of this toxin that can get you in deep mess with your health. So let's talk about some of the main symptoms of oxalate and how do you 
you know, are you checking your urine or how does someone see, how, what is the test to see, am I high in oxalates? Probably the best test, the true test is to, once you're informed, is to test it out on your own body. Um, but that takes a little finesse because you have to know what's going on because the uh, oxalate ends up accumulating in your body and you can get reactions from oxalate even when you stop eating it. In fact, some of the reactions to oxalate get even worse when you stop eating it because now you're allowing your body to remove oxalate that's been accumulating in your body. And the, the kind of effects it has on your cells leads to all kinds of symptoms and it's quite different for each person. But it can lead to arthritis, gout, osteopenia, osteoporosis, weak skin and connective tissue problems where you either have funny tensions or you know, like tennis elbow or uh, carpal tunnel, things like that. You get into inflammation and autoimmune problems like Hashimoto's thyroiditis, inflammatory depression. You get into hormonal problems and glandular damage and you can get into cellular energy production which gives you fatigue and promotes fat storage and obesity. You can get into neurological problems with memory problems, brain function issues like brain fog, mental fatigue. I had a lot of that. Uh, trouble with uh, irritability, depression, aggression, anxiety, uh, damaged cells and damaged mitochondria. That, again, it affects your ability to manage energy in your body and, and uh, organ damage, bones. It can look like aging, menopause, in things that are we consider normal, but in fact are avoidable and are like they're secretly because we're not paying attention to it. Like this secret poison is in all our favorite foods, and it's making us old and cranky way before our time. We don't have to be like that. It's completely avoidable. So, talk about what are calcium oxalate crystals, and how are they related to kidney stones? Okay, so. Oxalate is a word that's referring to lots of kinds of oxalic acid linked up with a mineral. So oxalic acid links up with calcium really easily. They have very high affinity for each other and hook up quickly. And some of the oxalates you eat are already in that calcium form. And some of them are even already constructed into giant crystals that are used by plants for self-defense. The plants make these arrows, these quiverful, where they're like double tipped toothpicks or these double-tipped pyramids, or these stocky kind of like um, prisms, you know? So, and they're kind of cool under microscope, they look pretty. Those are um, big crystals that the plants make that you tend not to absorb. It's more the molecules and nanocrystals that you absorb. And some of them are not in the calcium form yet. When the plant gives it to you, it gives you the form that's a more soluble form that breaks up easily, like the salt dissolves, those will dissolve, and that's the potassium oxalate, the sodium oxalate, and they get into your bloodstream and will grab the calcium, or the calcium grabs it, and starts forming these molecules that link up in pairs, and then when you get about eight or 12 of these pairs, you get a nanocrystal forming, so there's your calcium oxalate. And it goes from your digestive tract into your bloodstream to your liver, to your heart, to your lungs, back to your heart. And then the heart pumps it through the body and eventually it gets to the kidneys. And technically, even though calcium oxalate stays crystalline and doesn't dissolve into ions, it is in the water fraction. So therefore it's the kidney's job primarily to get it out of your body. So the kidneys have to have to traffic and oxalate all day long. And what the kidney does to defend itself from these crystals clumping, because that's what they'll start doing. They start growing, you know how you can do crystal growth, but crystals also clump. So you either have this sort of structure that where you get one crystal or you get a bunch of crystals all clumped together and kidney stones are a combination of both. A healthy kidney that's really great at handling oxalate produces so many proteins and citric acid that prevents the clumping and prevents the crystal growth. So you don't get kidney stones most of the time. But some people aren't producing enough of those inhibitors. We call them crystal inhibitors. Lots of molecules do this. And they're the ones who get these kidney stones. But 
pretty much anybody, if you keep overloading and overloading your body or you stop eating them and your body starts really moving them out quickly, you can move into and become somebody who's starting to form kidney stones. Mm. So <clears throat> let me just kind of rephrase. So like when you eat foods like, I mean, all these healthy foods that we're talking about, spinach, almonds, um, beets, strawberries, raspberries, like the healthiest foods that we can think of. So you're, you're eating these foods, your GI tract breaks them down, right? And it's absorbing those nutrients. And then now the leftover waste is now going into your kidneys, right? Well, it starts traveling around your body, you know? Yeah, it's traveling around your body and your... your eventually it gets to your kidneys. In the meantime, it's a very reactive molecule that's getting in there, the calcium oxalate is forming. And of course, the first thing it does is steal calcium from your blood. So already you're in a problem. You're in a, a clearly you're depleting your body of calcium and the bones have to replace that. And if you weigh a lot all at once, you overwhelm the bone's ability to respond and provide enough calcium and people get into heart arrhythmias and things like that because of the calcium. Loss. So now, if it gets to the kidneys and then some people get clumpy oxalates and other people can just urinate them out. And if, but if you tend to have a lot of cloudy urine, that is a condition called crystal urea. That means lots of crystals in your urine, lots of oxalate there. And I was one of those people, I would turn in a urine sample, you know, they used to do annual urine tests as part of your physical. And I, at least a third of the time, my, my, or maybe half the time, my urine was cloudy. No one ever mentioned that that could be something to look at and consider. But if that's, that's a great sign. If you're not a kidney stone person, but you do see cloudy urine, yay, you have cloudy urine, you able to excrete oxalate, that's good, but you're stressing your kidneys out, and it's a sign you have too much oxalate even in your diet and or in your body. So let's name some more symptoms. So cloudy urine would be one. What else? Um, any kind of aches and pains, fatigue, malaise. So you got your headaches, you got your joint pains, you got muscle pains, muscle knots, uh, rashes, stuff that starts to feel like autoimmune conditions and low hormone levels in general, brain issues, just general malaise, tendency to get a lot of phlegm and mucus because the oxalates trigger mast cell degranulation and you get release. Uh, bladder issues, irritable bladder, once in a while you have to get up at night or you suddenly have to go really fast or you feel like you have to go every half an hour with this like little tablespoon of urine, that, that's the crystals irritating your bladder. Um, pelvic pain, genital pain, That's a, there's a whole organization that helps people with pelvic and genital pain who's been testing foods for oxalate for 26 years now. So, so why would you have cloudy urine only 50% of the time? Is it because when you are eating those high oxalate foods, then your urine became cloudy? And then sometimes maybe you weren't eating those high oxalate foods, so then it wouldn't be cloudy? There's definitely a dietary effect. Like when you have a big uh, meal of high oxalate, it takes a few hours before the levels get high in the blood, and it takes several hours for the kidneys to clear that. So you're going to have a lag time. So if you eat a, a big dinner with Swiss chard and sweet potatoes, and by the time you lay in bed, your levels, both in your urine and your, especially your bloodstream, are at their highest at bedtime, which is a terrible time to be high in high oxalate because it interrupts connective tissue repair, repair in general. And that's what you do during sleep time is you repair all that little damage you cause by all your activities all day. So that's where it... it promotes chronic problems when you're not recovering from the day-to-day -day wear and tear and you end up with things like carpal tunnel or injuries that don't quite heal or scar tissue that never goes away that could. Um, that's another thing. So know, your question or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So kale is off the hook, right? Because it it only contains like 17 milligrams of oxalate. Yeah, where confusing one because... Some kales are really high. Green curly kale is quite high, but the, I think the red Russian kale is low. The dino kale is low. Several of the kales are quite low and several are quite high. So kale is like this 
weird kind of Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, whereas like cabbage is always really, really low. And mm -hmm. most of the cabbage vegetables in that whole family are pretty low. Uh, and if you boil your broccoli, you can leach out some of that soluble oxalate into the water. Just throw away the water. I mean, people have been so proud of themselves for saving their water when they're boiling greens and stuff and drinking that. Not a good idea. So name some of the green vegetables that are really low in oxalates that people should be eating a lot of. Well, I don't necessarily think you should be eating a lot of it. It depends on whether your body can handle cabbage vegetables or whether, you know, if they're cooked. Cooked is a lot easier to eat than raw in general, because and you're going to get more nutrients out of vegetables if you cook them. not a big fan of raw vegetables, especially in the cabbage family. So arugula is a great one to eat because it's low in oxalate, as is cabbage. But if you eat a lot of arugula salads or a lot of coleslaw, which is raw cabbage, you could be overdoing the raw cabbage and that's going to interfere with thyroid function because it has ends on your hinders. So cooked, mm -hmm. arugula is great. Um, let's see, some of the kales are good. Then there's things like romaine lettuce and leaf lettuce. All those are really low. Mosh, it's a form of a little green. It's sometimes called corn salad. Um, what else? There's several of them. But generally, if you worry about the three biggies to stay away from, which are beet greens, Swiss chard, and spinach, and choose your kale carefully, then the rest of the green things are okay. Gotcha. Now, you focus on helping others understand what oxalate poisoning is. Tell us, like, if you had to give someone their, if you had to give your top three best health tips that you would give someone in your coaching, what would they be? Well, if I could get people before they had this problem, because I work with people who are really sick and they're self-identifying, they've seen, they've now seen the connection and they reach out to me. So I work with people who are in horrible shape with their health and are struggling. But the real, the best tip of all is that prevention is much easier and is a much smarter approach than reversing a disease that has this long problem where it's now in your body, now your body has to excrete it and that's very hard in the body and it's not quick. And so that's the first thing. Don't keep believing our modern mythology around spinach and almond juice and almond butter and dark chocolate. That's another one that we didn't mention. Let's not keep going overboard on those things. And because pretty much eventually you, anybody could get in trouble with oxalate. Oxalate, by the way, has the same toxicity as asbestos. So if I were to sprinkle asbestos into your smoothie, would you still want to drink that? It's just no one ever told yeah. you there's this nanocrystal in there that's gonna mess with your entire body you know, it's just because we haven't heard of it that we're so like, what? Wait. And, and we, I was so attached to my sweet potatoes. Let me tell you, it took a long time to, for me to get over that. <laughs> okay. So that's tip one. Let's not overdo the oxalates in general. And please don't do this to your children. Don't make them eat spinach and Swiss chard. It's just not worth it. You're just hurt, hurting them and they don't want to eat it anyway. They're smarter than you are. So the number two one might be, if you do think you have this problem, don't go completely off oxalate foods too quickly because you might unmask this oxalate illness that's lurking silently in the background because it starts off as completely silent. You won't know you're sick with it. But if you start, you're just like kicking over a hornet's nest. If you suddenly unleash the oxalate in your bones or tendons or face or sinuses, then you might even feel worse. So it's better just to back off on the extreme level of poisoning, get down to something more reasonable and let the, because the body can't, you're just preventing it from kind of releasing or purging this oxalate if you're keeping some in your diet. So in the early days, keep some oxalate foods around in your diet. So that's number two. And then the third thing is that there is such a long process. It takes a long time to replace all your cells in your body, at least seven years to replace all your cells. So the body's gonna keep working on removing oxalate if the blood levels stay low, if you stop eating it consistently, and the body runs into an oxalate deposit that's in a muscle cell or a tendon or a bone, then it will try to get rid of it. And as it does that, that's difficult work because it has to break it down 
to the little molecules that are most stressful on the tissue. So you're causing some tissue stress and damage, loss of electrolytes as you're releasing them. So you need to continually be aware that you may continue need to provide support and that future symptoms, say some tennis elbow or tendonitis or something, or some tooth pain might be related to your body's healing, which is another point for people to understand that it's not your symptom today may not be from yesterday's salad. It might be from now that you're not eating oscillate, your body is doing healing work that involves some tissue damage in the process. So, and then another tip might be, okay, because this, Oxalate's moving around. It's continuing to cause some release and flushing and loss of minerals. So you have to keep replacing minerals and electrolytes every day. Awesome. So in the, I just finished writing my second edition of my book and I talk about how people don't have to deprive themselves when it comes to food, but everyone needs to decide for themselves. What are their red light foods, their yellow light foods, their green light foods. So for you, what are your red light foods where you go, look, this is absolutely off the table for me. No chance am I ever putting this in my mouth. And then you've got some yellow light foods where you go, you know, I don't feel great when I eat this, but I feel okay. Well, you know, and this is a very personal thing because we're all sort of damaged in our own ways. But for a lot of us who got digestive tract damage because we have a history of too many legumes and undercooked and slow cooked beans that's high lectins, a lot of oxalate, uh, we tend to have leaky gut history and we tend to have a lot of sensitivities. And I'm one of those people, I have a lot of reactivity. I come from allergic stock. My Both my parents tended to have allergies. And so the oxalate damage kind of gets you where you're vulnerable. And I think I'm vulnerable in the kind of immune reaction thing. And a lot of us are these days. So I listen to the testing that I've had done that suggests that I'm super allergic to glidian, which is everything basically gluten stuff. And I'm so really big on staying off the gluten, the beans, all the high oxalate foods. I um, tend to have uh, constipation, which is another common damage that happens with oxalate problems. And the less fiber I eat, the better. So I eat no fiber or carbs in the morning. I always let my gut at least rest morning and tend to um, have gotten lately I've just really moved away from plant foods generally so I, I my body likes certain meats it doesn't like chicken it doesn't like three kinds of fish like I'm I really have to like pick and choose carefully and I really believe in that because that's what it takes for me to feel good I don't so much believe in yellow light foods because I'm interested in being awesome so I I, I hate it when I feel bad I really don't want to feel bad I have no food matters more than feeling good for me. So I, it's not a, a big problem. Like I don't like to compromise with my own vitality. That's a bad, that's a deal with the devil to me. I don't care about doing that. Yeah, I love that. That That's true. And, and that's what I say. Everyone's got to decide for themselves. What are the foods that just, they don't make them feel good. Why eat it? Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the episode so far, but as you know, I've interviewed over a thousand women and every time I've watched a thin eater eat, I realize that maintaining a healthy weight is a skill that can be taught and mastered over time. That's why I created a video course that will teach you all the tips that I learned to help me lose over 30 pounds. It's way more powerful to watch the thin eaters than even to listen or to read it. Go to ChantelRayWay.com slash video for a free glimpse. If you're wanting to take yourself to the next level, everyone needs a coach. Every professional player has a coach. We want to come alongside you and help you in your journey. Go to ChantelRayWay.com slash coaching. I just had someone listen to the audiobook three times and she just emailed me and she said by her listening to the audiobook three times, that's what did it. That's what allowed her to really lose the weight. We have an amazing offer for you. It's the second edition of my book, which has tons more information. It has the audiobook, the ebook. It normally runs for $29.99. You can get it today for $4.99. Go to ChantelRayway.com slash deal to get it. Now back to the show. All right, let's jump right into the listener questions. This is from Lydia in Charleston. 
My one weakness when it comes to food is sugar. I love all cakes and candies. After just about every meal, I literally need to eat something sweet. It doesn't have to be an entire cake, but a piece of chocolate or cookie is fine. I've been trying to cut back on my sugar intake, but it's so hard. What are some substitutes I could eat to help kick this terrible sweet tooth of mine? So I think the sweet tooth is evidence of nutrient deficiencies and um, probably not getting enough of several kinds of nutrients that you need. So it's really important to start making sure that the food you are eating is very uh, nourishing and you may need to look into some supplementation as well. And then really work with yourself. Like what is that attachment? Can you have a non-sweet meal every day. I really recommend breakfast being no carb. Thing. And one tip in terms of like helping your palate know that your meal is done and you don't have to turn the sugar into the meal is to end your meal with something sour, something like yogurt, a pickle, something like that. And you do the sour taste and it, somehow it helps you just finish your meal. So, mm. so sometimes it's a simple thing like that. And But, you know, we're sort of programmed for dessert and if your parents were rewarding you, you know, eat your broccoli so you can have your dessert, you're like trained, in trained in the most deep unconscious level. And you just have to start just saying no to that and just deciding as an adult, you're going to parent yourself a little differently and stop thinking you need, give yourself some other reward after dinner. Awesome. I love that. All right. This next one's from Rachel in Texas. My dad has always struggled with gout. I remember when I was a kid, he would have so much trouble walking around all day at an amusement park. I've done a little research and I know salt intake is a main factor of gout flare ups. I also thought I also saw that it could be hereditary. Is that true? Now, every time I have some pain, I start to worry that it might be gout. Is there anything I can do to help me prevent this from possibly getting it too? Yeah, well, it turns out that gout is probably a major oxalate problem. And so a low oxalate diet is really much smarter than a salt restricted diet. I'm, I'm not buying the idea that salt and gout are intimately connected and directly connected. I would focus more on the, see, oxalate is a crystallizing food and it gets into the joints. And I really think that uric acid follows oxalate around the body as an anti-inflammatory and protective agent in that. It might even come along and kick out the oxalate and, and so then you get calcium gouts or other, or calcium urate crystals, uric acid crystals in places where there used to be oxalate crystals. And then that's what we tend to blame gout on is uric acid. It, and they think that that's coming from meat, which is not at all true. When I had gout symptoms and I was told I had gout, that was when I was a vegan. That was when I had the highest oxalate diet probably. And, and so I think gout is more about the vegetables and the really about oxalate, honestly. So, and there is a, I think, rather hereditary tendency for how oxalate affects you and whether you get a gout versus you get depression versus you get skin problems or whatever. So there's a lot of variability. Like the terrain is your heredity. So oxalate's going to get you where you're weak. All right, Tina in Huntsville. I have an autoimmune disease, Hashimoto's, and I'm struggling hard to cope with this. It always causes me to become depressed. It affects my everyday life, and now it's affecting my diet. I've recently gained about 10 pounds just from eating because that's the only thing that makes me feel better. What else can I do to snap myself out of this depressive state? Do you have any tips for me to not fall back into this state again? Yeah, I, I deal with this a lot with my clients because a lot of us, I was told I had Hashimoto's thyroiditis and it was oxalate crystals. And a huge number of us have oxalate crystals in our thyroid gland and it's really um, pulling down glandular function. And the more glandular damage you have, the more oxalate accumulates. So it becomes a vicious cycle. And I was able to get rid of the lumpy thyroid and go way down on my thyroid medication. Many of my clients have depressive symptoms related to oxalate. And when the oxalates are coming out, you feel this like flat affect. You don't care about anything. You get excited about life. And you get brain depression and anxiety attacks. And you can really let that stuff pull you down. And I think if you're 
over identifying with I'm depressed versus this depression is happening. I wonder why that symptom is here. Have a little space between that. And there are a lot of things we can do to snap ourselves out of depression. Cryotherapy is awesome for mood lifting. If you do it frequently enough, you know, at least three times a week and continue doing that for like six months, you can get a lot of benefits from that. Uh, light exposure, being outside during sunrise and sunset times when you get red light energy on the skin, getting some time outside or even artificial UVB light during midday. Again, is a good one. Getting up and talking to someone or getting a face in front of you. You can even turn on the TV and see a face on the TV. That is good for your mood and alertness in the morning. Getting out and touching your feet to the ground and picking up electrons, that's anti-inflammatory as well. That helps to stop free radicals from flying through your body. So there's a lot of things you can do. And certainly if you wanna surround your life with good music, good flowers, not too much clutter, you know, like don't surround yourself with anything that pulls you down and keeps you in this place of stuckness. But it's very possible that the combination of depression and Hashimoto's is just a sign that you have oxalate poisoning. All right, this next question says, the other day I just found a small, very dry and itchy patch of skin on the back of my neck. I didn't think much about it until it continued to itch all day, every day. I've tried putting on moisturizing lotion to help with dryness, but sometimes it burns when I use it. I haven't switched my laundry detergent and haven't been using any new kinds of lotions or body washes. Nothing really triggers it to start itching. It just itches all day. Although some days are worse than others. Could this be the start of psoriasis and will it spread to other areas. Is there any kind of lotion or cream that will help the itching? Boy, that sounds like an oxalate symptom to me. I hear about this kind of stuff all the time. It shows up on the skin, itchy, dry, burning, the burning, especially that burning, burning sensation interact with the nerves and so on. So, you know, it could be something that will start to go away pretty quickly when you change your diet to a low oxalate diet. In the meantime, some aloe with a little bit of tea tree oil might help a bit. Coconut oil, I like aloe a lot. Awesome. Well, where can our listeners go to follow you and your work? Okay, well, I have a website. It's sallyknorton.com, and there's a ton of information on there. All kinds of questions are already answered for free on all the different tabs. You can go into the support section, and in there you can find in the shop section free documents you can download and some very inexpensive documents there. And then I've been playing around with Instagram lately, and we're having cool conversations on Instagram where people are sharing their stories of oxalate and oxalate dumping. And I'm uh, SK Norton on Instagram. And I do have a Facebook page and Twitter, but I tend to not hang out there very much. So I recommend my website and Instagram right now. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on our show today. This is such an interesting topic. And I will be honest with you. I didn't, until I met you in person, I didn't, I never even heard of the word oxalate and I knew nothing about oxalate. So I feel like you're really like teaching people and like, they're really like, I'm sure a lot of people have not heard of this before. So it's really not being discussed. I'm just embarrassed for my own profession in public health because we're not making this a known thing. I think in public health, we should say, hey, there's an upper limit to these green vegetables. or these. And so I'm hoping to change that because it's insane that we're trying to get healthy and it's hurting us. But that's not fair. <laughs> yes. Well, if you have a question that you want answered, go to questions at chantalrayway.com. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.